Maraming salamat, Attorney Ayra, for your kind introduction. As I mentioned in the first webinar, this webinar series was conceptualized. Sorry. As I mentioned in the first webinar, this webinar series was conceptualized and designed to empower all our graduates, both college and senior high school students, to carefully choose which sector or industry they wish to join in order to increase their chances of success and to equip them with the tools and skills in order to thrive in your chosen careers. Ultimately, this webinar aims to democratize knowledge and information on career options for graduating students. For this afternoon, we are excited to introduce you to the country's biggest, most extensive, and perpetually in need employer, the government. In order to whet your appetite desiring to work in the government, allow me to briefly share my own professional journey. I pursued law in 1998 as a working student, studying law at the University of the Philippines while working as a member of staff of then Congressman Ignacio. Recording in progress. After which, at the office of then Congressman Plaridel E. Mabaya. 2004, I was admitted to the bar. Most of my peers and batchmates joined law firms. I chose the road less traveled, staying in government, but transferring from legislative to the executive. After passing the bar, I joined the office of the president as director for. In 2010, I left the office of the president as an undersecretary and with a master's degree in law to pursue my legislative advocacies. I didn't make it in the 2010 elections when I first ran for Congress under Cabayan Party List. A year after, I practiced law by establishing my own law office, but the call for public service was immense. In 2012, I accepted consultancies in various government offices while practicing law. In 2016, I became a member of the House of Representatives on my second attempt under the same Cabayan Party List. This is now my second term as a member of Congress and working hard in pursuing our advocacies on health, housing, livelihood, education, and OFW welfare. We pursue policy reforms to empower every Filipino to be able to live a life of dignity. For us in the government, each of us has our own stories to tell concerning our journey in government service, the calling we have, the challenges we face, and the commitment we uphold. Despite challenges, we remain resolute in our service in the government. We draw strength and inspiration in the lives of people we touch and find meaning and joy in advancing fundamental principles that make us truly human. Today, we are deeply honored to have with us our esteemed resource persons from various branches of the government who will share their journey in the civil service. They are exemplars of public service and government career. Indeed, no less than the fifth highest official, and the consequently, the highest non-elective official of our land is here to share his own journey with us. It is a very rare opportunity to hear a man of his stature on his insights and wisdom of joining government service. And yet, for the love of our youth and the genuine concern on the decisions they will soon make on their careers as they are our country's future. He never hesitated to grace us with his presence. With that, thank you very much, Chief Justice Alexander G. Hismundo, for accepting our invitation. I will welcome you all to the second of our 14-part webinar series. I am certain that we are ready and excited to listen to our esteemed and highly res learned resource persons. Sa lahat ng ating mga mag-aaral at kanilang mga magulang na nasa Zoom at nanonood sa FB Live, mga guru at propesor, at sa mga magagaling at pinagpipitagan nating mga speakers, magandang hapon sa ating lahat. Sama-sama muli tayong makinig at matuto ngayong hapon. Maraming salamat po, Congressman Ron Salo, for those welcome remarks. Uh, it is now my honor to introduce the highest position in the legal profession, the Chief Justice, Alexander G. Gesmundo. He was appointed to the Supreme Court as Associate Justice in 2017 and later as the 27th Chief Justice of the Philippines on April 5, 2021. 
Previously, he was Associate Justice of the Sagindigan Bayan, appointed in 2005, where he served as chairperson of its seventh division. Chief Justice Gesmundo obtained his law degree from the Ateneo de Manila University in 1984 and passed the bar in April 1985. <laughs> he entered government service in August 1985 as trial attorney in the office of the Solicitor General and where he was awarded Most Outstanding Solicitor in 1998. In August 2002, he was promoted to Assistant Solicitor General. Chief Justice Gesmundo is a member of the Corps of Professors and Professorial Lecturer of the Philippine Judicial Academy, or FILJA, and a Professorial Lecturer in Remedial Law. He was the examiner in Remedial Law in the 2009, which is actually my bar, Chief Justice, and 2015 bar examinations. He has taught various Remedial Law subjects at the Ateneo de Manila University, the Central Escolar University School of Law and Jurisprudence, the Lyceum of the Philippines, and the University of Perpetual Help Dalta, the USD Faculty of Civil Law, and the Pamantasan ng Lusod ng Pasay. Apart from his official duties, Chief Justice Gesmundo also participated as co-chairperson of the final board of judges in Metro Bank Foundation's annual search for outstanding Filipinos in August 2019. Prior to joining the government, Chief Justice Gesmundo worked as a research analyst from 1977 to 79 with Business Day Corporation, publisher of the business newspaper Business Day and Top 1000 Corporations of the Philippines, wherein a few of his articles were published. In 1979 to 1980, he worked as market research officer at the Office of Australian Trade Commissioner, Australian Embassy Manila, and continued as its marketing officer in 1980 to 1980. He is the son of Juan Eges Mundo, a farmer, and Zenaida B. Cajon, a public school teacher. Ladies and gentlemen, the Chief Justice uh, <clears throat> Gesmundo. Chief Justice, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Paolo, for that introduction. <clears throat> Commissioner on Higher Education Chairperson, Dr. Prospero Popoy E. De Vera. Representative Ron P. Salo. Civil Service Chairperson Alicia De La Rosa Bala, Commission on Human Rights Commissioner Karen Lucia Gomez Dumpit, Presidential Communications Operation Office Undersecretary Attorney Michael Christian Arablan, Pasay City Regional Trial Court Presiding Judge Ruena Nieves Eitan, all participants and guests, good afternoon. Thank you, Ron, for mentioning that I started my legal career in 1985 as trial attorney at the Office of the Solicitor General. And until now, I still work with the government. For more than 30 decades, uh, three decades, all my legal uh, profession was spent with the government in the name of public service. Let me begin from the position of the individual because that is where public starts to exist. That in Dera in a Sari Sari store or in the wet market, the office clerk filing papers, a cashier counting money in the bank, or the pharmacist in the drugstore, even the wood gatherer, the farmer planting in the field, the fisherman sailing in open sea, or the deep knee driver with his passengers, the surgeon, the physical therapist, the architect, the construction worker, the teacher, the soldier and the police, the Filipino worker overseas, chefs in the hotel, billionaire and sidewalk vendor, and all other individuals. They are the collective landscape of the public over whom service from government in various forms must be given based on a relationship of trust according to the law. The statement, therefore, that public office is a public trust is a dictum that is meant to carry an obligation enshrined in the Office of Government Officials and Employees who must render service to the people. Precisely because they have entered into the required expectations of the office, they hold in trust. Public service is a code of honor, a testament of integrity, a pledge of obedience. It is not a subjective choice. It's an explicit decision demanding exactitude of duty. The human condition of a nation 
is reflected in the quality of its public servants. If, sub if public servants are responsible bureaucrats, the nation progresses. If they are abusive and propagate, the nation deteriorates. The system of governance functions well when the rotors of administrative machine are synchronized with the basic needs of the public. Knowing that the government is the biggest employer in the land is sufficient incentive for any aspiring career researcher who believes that working in government is a significant contribution to help build the nation. The multiplic multiplicity of work in the three independent and co-equal branches of government is an awesome groundswell of opportunities for those who are seriously searching for meaningful jobs. The opportunities are many, but there are qualifying requirements for admission. There is the Commission on Higher Education, that prepares graduates of advanced discipline in specific courses. And there is the Civil Service Commission that provides the qualification standards and written tests for the different levels of work and salary grades in the hierarchy of government positions. It would be well to consider the broad spectrum of public service in tandem with the widest range of professional work that civil service entails. It is my belief that the underlying concern should be, as I mentioned in our opening line, the position of the individual. What are the basic needs that can be serviced by government? Sometimes the biggest tasks are often the simplest. The ideal is to understand the crop of supplying opportunities and self-reliant livelihood activities for the improvement of those who need this most. This is not something beyond the ambit of civil service. It is in fact the beginning of all worthy endeavors. It has been often said that government service is a thankless job. No matter how hard one sees to, sees to it, that the greater good is served, there will always be those who will be left out, not because of the public service inadequacy, but because of circumstances beyond one's control. A scrupulous civil servant will at some point in his or her team with the government, experience being pelted with scathing denunciations. More often than not, many will indiscriminately and mindlessly cast aspersions on those who do the most for the sake of general welfare, ascribing imagined motives to those religiously fulfilling their sworn oaths of service. Nonetheless, Prospective civil servants should realize that a stable job with predictable benefits is but a privilege. It comes with all these difficulties. While staking one's reputation is not commensurate to the stable monetary benefits enjoyed by a government worker, it is an honorable calling and an incomparable opportunity for one to serve other than oneself. In essence, Public servants are unsung heroes of the modern times. Thus, when these new civil servants feel proud and contented with their work, as well as mindful of their crucial role affecting the general welfare, it translates to remodeling the culture of public service. Such is the crucial role of this web webinar to make the prospective entrance to public service realize that more responsibility is expected from government workers, for unlike their counterparts in the private sector, their acts affect not only of the institution that they are employed in, but also the public at large. If we can just do our part genuinely and with pride, we can change the state of public service for the better. This then is the call for those whose love for country and people are indelibly, indelibly written in their hearts. It is the noblest ideal of a career that carves the growth of a nation from one's soul. It is the passion for radical change and the faith that change can be done. No sacrifice can measure to the honor it gives because the trust between the public that is served and those who provide the service is ultimately a call for patriots. We began with the position of the individual as the integral part of the public to be served. 
we now end beyond them. May public service be the trust we uphold. Fair forward and God bless. Good afternoon and thank you. Thank you very much, Chief Justice Alexander G. Mundo, for that keynote address. Um, before we proceed, we would like to thank you on behalf of all of the um, organizers of this event. So we'd like to present you with this digital certificate of appreciation from Kabayan Party List, the Shipping Alumni Foundation, the Philippines Inc., the Commission of Higher Education, the Department of Education, Cavite State University, Cebu Normal University, Ilohio Amang Rodriguez Institute of Science and Technology, the Polytechnic University of the Philippines, and the Tarlac State University. This certificate of appreciation is hereby presented to Chief Justice Alexander G. Gesmundo, keynote speaker, for genuinely sharing his time, experiences, and invaluable insights in the C2C College to Career webinar series for graduating college and senior high school students entitled Carving Out a Career in Government, held on the 28th day of May, 2021, via Zoom, signed by Dr. Ron Pisalo, LLB, LLM, Ed T, Representative Kabayan Party List, and President of the Shivning Alumni Foundation of the Philippines, Inc., by Dr. Manuel M. Muhi, DTEC, ASEAN Engineer, University President of the Polytechnic University of the Philippines. Chief Justice Gismundo, thank you very, very much. To the organizers, may we now proceed? Can you, can you flash the profile, please, of CSC Chair Alicia de Rosario Papa? Our next speaker is the chairperson of the Civil Service Commission, Alicia de la Rosa Bala. She is the chairperson of the Central Human Resource Agency of the Government, the Civil Service Commission. Prior to her appointment, she was the Undersecretary for Policy and Plans of the Department of Social Welfare and Development, where, which she has served for the past 39 years. She also served as Deputy Secretary General for the ASEAN Social Cultural Community Department in Jakarta, Indonesia. She was given recognition by ambassadors of member countries for her contributions to ASEAN at the conclusion of her term. At the DSWD, Chairperson Bala started as training officer in 1976 and worked her way up the organizational ladder, holding the positions of social welfare specialist, division chief, director, regional director, and assistant secretary. In 2004, she was DSWD's first best manager awardee, and in 2012, she was awarded outstanding career executive service officer by the Career Executive Service Board. Chairperson Bala was appointed as the country's first child rights representative to the ASEAN Commission for the Promotion and the Protection of the Rights of Women and Children in 2010. She was also elected the first elected head of the first session of the Commission on Social Development, United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and Pacific in 2008. Chairperson Bala received her master's degree in social work from the University of Philippines Institute of Social Work and Community Development and her bachelor's degree in social work from the Central Escolar University. Ladies and gentlemen, the chairperson of the Civil Service Commission, Chairperson Alicia De La Rosa Bala. Chair, you have the floor. Paul. Thank you, Attorney Ira, for that introduction. Um, Congressman Salo, the other panelists later, I'm sure they'll be in, uh, introduced to all the organizers of this event and to the um, students and graduates from college and the senior high school. Magandang hapon sa inyong lahat. Good afternoon. Uh, Asalamu alaikum. If there are some who are um, Muslim um, brothers and sisters around, naimbag na malem yung amin ako. I'm very happy to be part of this event because um, I remember almost five decades ago, when I also graduated from college, the first thing that came to mind was, what career will I pursue? Will I join the private sector or the government sector? Later on, you will find out. But um, maybe this time, this is also the 
the questions that I'd like you to ponder upon. One, do you want to pursue a career that will allow you to make a difference in the lives of the Filipino people and join an organization that offers professional and development and advancement opportunities as well as competitive pay and benefits like what uh, CJ already mentioned earlier. If you answered yes to any of the questions, allow me now to, to be of service by giving you a brief orientation on joining the government service. First slide, please. Just an introduction to the Philippine Civil Service since the establishment of the Philippine Civil Service in the 1900s, so you can just imagine it's 121 years already, the government has had evolved into what we can consider today as an employer of choice. Now, the next slides are not in any way meant to discourage you or to scare you, but to prompt a deep reflection, a soul searching to determine if a career in government service is your calling because for me, it is. Okay, next slide. Next slide, please. The first, uh, um, go back to the, the other, the first, the first one. Okay. To me, public service as a calling, and just to highlight the fact, and this was already mentioned by the CJ, and I'd like to quote a report entitled, A Strong Foundation, of the Task Force on Public Service, Values, and Ethics in Canada. It says that it, it describes exactly what a public service as a calling. In fact, when I read this, it, I didn't even realize that what I believe in when I joined government, I said to myself, this is a calling. And it says here, and that study it says that public service is a special calling it is not for everyone, and those who respond to the call pay a price. The price is submitting to very high standards of professional conduct, accepting public scrutiny and accountability, learning to hold a public trust and to put public interests ahead of self, respecting the authority of law and of democratic will, and entering into a community that values this as the foundations of good government. The values of public service are both its pride and its reward, end of quote. So when, fundamentally, being in government requires an understanding and willingness to adhere what was explicitly stated on Section 1, Article 11 of the 1987 Constitution that public office is a public trust. And I think this was repeatedly stated by CJ or the Chief Justice. And let me share the, the pertinent portions of the decision of, of, the, decision of the Supreme Court in the case of Sambuanga versus CA. And it, this is about the guiding principles uh, when it comes to um, when you enter government service. Okay, now um, the next slide, please. Apart from this, uh, one right now, just to let you know that there are 1.7 million state workers are governed by the code of conduct and ethical standards for, for public officials and employees or the Republic Act number 6713. This 30-year-old law prescribes eight norms of conduct when you enter government and these are public interest commitment to public interest professionalism justness and sincerity political neutrality responsive to the pub the public nationalism and patriotism commitment to democracy and simple living and are in a, and so therefore the guiding principles as mentioned Paulit-ulit kung sasabihin na public office is a public trust. And so therefore, as um, mentioned earlier, you have to be accountable and you have to commit yourselves that you serve the Filipino people above oneself or interests. Okay, now next, let me now go to uh, the overview of the presentation for you to get acquainted with public service. Since we have settled that matter of what 
is required of you when you enter public service. Now let me share with you the agency that is responsible for the civil servants in the bureaucracy, or we call them, we call ourselves to be the civil servants, and the agency responsible is the Civil Service Commission. It shall, the mandate is, it shall establish a career service that to promote moral efficiency, integrity, responsiveness, and courtesy in the civil service. It also strengthens the merit and reward system and um, integrate all human resources development programs for all levels and ranks and institutionalize a management climate conducive to public accountability. And um, uh, in addition to this, uh, the civil service by virtue of Executive Order 292 or otherwise known as the Administrative Government um, Administrative Code of 1987 provides that the civil service, among others, administer and enforce the constitutional and statutory provisions of the merit system for all levels in the civil service. Prescribe, amend, and enforce rules and regulations for carrying out into effective civil service law and other pertinent laws and promulgate policies, standards, and guidelines for the civil service. Now, let me uh, share with you what is the scope of the civil service, okay? One, okay, which I just wanted you to know that the civil service embraces all branches of government, meaning the executive, the legislative, and even the subsidiary, uh, the judiciary, subdivisions, instrumentalities, and agencies of the government, and including government-owned or controlled corporation corp with original charters, and the, the state universities and colleges, local universities and colleges, and the local government units. And so therefore, all agencies are governed by civil service laws and rules. Now, what are the positions in the civil service? We now, uh, we, at this point, I have to move on to the discussion of classifications and, um, and, and uh, in the civil service, okay? Um, one, uh, under civil service law, positions in government for which persons may be appointed to are classified into two. Career service and non-career service. So what do we mean by career service? One, when you are considered as a career service that you have entered into, uh, there is, this is characterized by entrance based on merit and witness, fitness, determined through competitive exams. And precisely that's why annually, we um, administer a civil service exams, both professional and sub-professionals, except for last year, because of the start of the pandemic, we were not able to conduct the same because of the physical distancing requirements and other protocols that need to be observed. Now, and then the second is the opportunity for advancement to higher career positions if you are in the career and then you also have what we call a security of tenure, and it has seven categories. One, okay, now let me go to the different categories of the career. The open career, meaning these are generic or service-wide positions in the government service. Uh, examples are of, of this, okay? So, if, ibig sabihin, lahat ng pwedeng yung pasukan ay panawag namin dyan ay career service. Pangalawa, the closed career. Anong ibig sabihin ng closed career? Close career positions are limited to scientific or highly technical in nature, such as faculty and academic staff of state universities and colleges, and scientific and technical positions in scientific or research institutions, agencies, and these have their own merit system. Okay. And then the other one is the career executive service refers to the following positions naman in government, no? Uh, one is, um, yung mga positions na ito, ito na yung mga matataas. Ito yung mga magsisimula sa uh, depart uh, department head, 
assistant regional director, regional director, assistant bureau director, um, bureau director, assistant secretary, and under secretary. So yung naka-flash lang sa inyo, yung kinatek-categorize lang na first level, second level, and the third level. So yung ano. And then there's another an, another career uh, service in government. This is what we call the foreign service officers or FSOs. Ito naman, these are the positions available when you are interested to join the foreign service or the Department of Foreign Affairs. And um, this is also, we call them um, also a closed career because they have a specific requirements and they have a specific law for one to join being a member of the foreign service officers. Okay. And one advantage of this is if, if you build your career in the Department of Foreign Affairs, you will have the opportunities to be um, posted um, globally and you can be an ambassador or um, charge the affair or consul general among others. Okay. And then the other one would be the commission officers in the armed forces. These are officers of the armed forces of the Philippines or AFP. And they also have a separate system in the military. And then the sixth would be the personnel of government owned or controlled corporations with original charters. Why am I emphasizing with original charters? Because there are some who are considered as GOCCs, but they are not considered under the, the ambit of the civil service. Why? Because these are creations by virtue of uh, a law, but they are uh, uh, by virtue of the creation under a GOCC, like for example, PNOC, and then they would create, you know, the the the, the other um, agencies under them, and they are registered under the Securities and Exchange. So therefore, they are not considered as uh, the coverage of the civil service. And then, of course, uh, the the next would be the the permanent lab laboral positions and those who are appointed to first level positions with the duties requiring non-professional or sub-professional capacity or less than four years of collegiate studies. Now, under the levels in the career service, as I've said, there are three. We have first level, which covers clerical, uh, trades, crafts, custodial service positions, which involve non-professional or some professional work requiring less than four years of college. And then the second level, this covers already the professional, technical, and scientific positions. And um, and but they are not performing in a work in a non-supervisory or supervisory capacity, requiring at least four years of college. Um, and they can work up to being a division chief. This includes, but uh, because Later on, you will find out that at the third level career positions, these are all positions appointed by the president. So if they are not uh, appointed by the president, for example, in the case of the Civil Service Commission, our directors, they are not considered as third level. And they are under category level two, um, the second level, but exercising executive managerial functions. Now, let me now discuss what are the non-career positions naman in government. So, um, sino sino sila? Entrance is based other than those of the usual test of merit or fitness utilized for the career service. Tenure is limited to fix to a period specified by law or fixed term appointments, or which is limited to the duration of a particular project or activity. So what are the examples of non-career um, officials? Okay, let's now stop, talk about the officials. These are the local chief executives or the elective officials and their personal or confidential staff. Secretaries and other officials of the presidential cabinet trunk who hold their positions at the pleasure of the president or, or, the, or the head of the agency or the secretaries. And the chairpersons and members of the commissions like the Civil Service Commission, I have my own staff, but this is what we call co-terminals with appointing authorities and these are highly um, 
uh, considered as confidential, primarily confidential possessions. And contractual employees, because uh, it's limited, the, the term, they have because for a specific number of years for completion of the project, but these are still considered as um, a government service, but non-career. Or even the casual, they are also considered as, um, uh, as um, non-career because they are also hired for a specific um, function or to, to perform. Okay. And, um, and the other one is, um, and, but the specific jobs that they are performing is with a minimum supervision or direction from, uh, from the agency. Okay. So there are also emergency and what we call the seasonal personnel such as casual, laborers with appointments that last for six to one year and are renewable. Okay. Now let's move to how do I enter government? Okay. Especially from your end. So what are the qualification standards? Okay. Now let me start that for any position in government, there are requirements. Okay. Now let me discuss with you. Uh, the, um, the 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 common the, the see uh, as I've said everything with the system, the agencies uh, let me just remind that the agencies are the ones that will establish their own qualification standards with the assistance and approval of the commission. So there would uh, the agency, for example, uh, Department of Education, they will set the standards but it should not be lower than what the, the civil service has set. They can go higher when it comes to the recruitment requirements to make sure that they wanted to, to maintain probably a higher level of professionalism. They, they can set higher standards, but they cannot go down um, with the, the, the civil service standards. And, um, and so, therefore, they, they are the ones who would um, be asked to do the same. And um, there are also pertinent laws where um, other agencies can, can prescribe some requirements, like, for example, the Professional Regulation Commi um, Commission or the PRC, if you want to practice a profession like being an educator, edu um, educator a social worker, a lawyer, um, a doctor, a nurse, you have to pass the board exams for this uh, for these professions for you to uh, practice. Okay, and um, the assessment of the 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 the, the applicants will be not, will not only based on the qualification standards, um, which I will be discussing with you later on. Now let's go to the, the QS dimensions, the qualification standards. Uh, one is um, education, okay, education, uh, experience, training, and eligibility. But as I've said, there are instances when the eligibility may not be required, especially if the positions are non-career and those that are at the first level, okay. So when you talk about um, education, it refers to the formal and non-formal academic, technical, or vocational studies that will enable the candidate to successfully perform the duties and responsibilities indicated in the uh, personal de um, development form of the position to be filled. And um, we, for those that are graduates from college, we would also request um, the CHED. Uh, they have this, uh, they, they, they are also requiring that there should be an issue once from the CHED that they are in the list of uh, college graduates, okay. And um, when, when you talk about the senior high school, especially if, the, if you pursue the, the book tech, uh, we need also the certificates and these are valid for appointments. The so positions requiring completion of elementary or high school or, you know, the senior, the, the the junior high school, uh, junior senior high school education, and uh, for um, Chet, they're also um, they, we are also requiring them um, for if they're graduates from 
uh, accredited or authorized by CHED, we need to have the diploma and certificate um, for positions requiring uh, college education. So the, these are the things that we need as a supporting documents. For experience, it refers to the previous jobs in either the government or private sector, whether full-time or part-time, as certified by the HR officer or supervisor in the previous agency uh, or employer. And then relevant experience means one's experience should be functionally related to the position that you will be applying for. And then the, and then the other one would be training. Uh, training means uh, non-formal or formal training courses and other HRD interventions such as coaching, mentoring, job rotation, seminars, workshops, among others, even conferences. And um, it, it is meant that this, this would prepare you to, to assume positions in government. Now, the last would be eligibility. So if you are, if you are uh, requiring to be in government, there are certain positions, whether it's a sub-prof or professional. So when I say sub-prof, we have um, one of the examinations to conduct is a sub-prof so that you can also enter government if the requirement is only a sub-prof eligibility um, that is required of you. Now, but if it is a practice or profession, you have to make sure that you have passed um, the, the PRC board exams related to your to the functions or to the positions that you will be applying for. Now, the, on the other hand, we also have what we call the professional eligibility that is uh, um, administered by the civil service. So that when you have this eligibility and it does not require practice um, education, uh, uh, being a medical practitioner, uh, but you wanted to, to um, enter government, that would be good enough that you pass this um, this exam uh, this eligibility. Okay, but I just I'm, these are good. These are also um, an, um, one of the things that I wanted you to know that you can avail also special eligibilities. So now let me share with you. There are three. These are what we call the most common availed of, especially if you're a college graduate. One is what we call honor graduate eligibility. Next, I think we, uh, the next, um, I don't know if we, I have a slide on that, but honor students. If you are graduated as cum laude, manya cum laude, or summa cum laude, you can avail and you can apply for eligibility in the, in the commission uh, when you have completed the, the baccalaureate um, um, degrees. And uh, in fact, uh, just recently, um, uh, last year, we have issued that even honors graduate eligibility can be granted to Filipinos who studied abroad. And they also uh, earned this, um, this um, uh, Latin honors equivalent to cum laude, magna cum laude, or summa cum laude. And uh, if I heard it right, um, Kong Salo was magna uh, cum laude. And then uh, the other one is yung electronic data processing, uh, specialist eligibility. And this is a proficiency test conducted by the DICT on systems analysis and design computer programming. So, in you can also be, be um, hired for the purpose. And then, if you were a sanggunian ng kabataan chairman or chairperson, when you were, uh, because I know that there are a number of you must have been an SK, but this is only, this is what we call eligibility for local um, uh, executives or local local um, officials, no, uh, but not necessarily uh, like the mayors because these are elected. Um, but we particularly uh, uh, give uh, recognize um, the SK. So as long as you have completed three years term, you can also apply for this special eligibility for for local um, uh, like the SK and even the 
barangay chairpersons and all that stuff. And then even barangay health um, uh, uh, service, no? barangay health um, workers, if you have... Uh, you have been a volunteer barangay health workers and you've been in you intend to join government you can also apply because there is a special law for the purpose so as i've mentioned uh, these are the the most common eligibilities that you can avail without passing the the civil service commission and or the the prc we call them the ra by by virtue of the republic act 1080 uh, as I've said, the bar, uh, medical uh, doctors, nurses, accountants, teachers, engineers. Of course, there are different categories of engineers. Now, um, let me just go through um, a simple um, discussion about the recruitment selection process. Okay. Um, uh, when when we do the 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 the, the recruitment. Um, it will start with the publication and posting of vacant positions as required under Republic Act Number Seventy Forty One. So the, the the publication. So for you to know where to look at where the vacancies are, one is they can be agencies can publish it either at the national or local um, uh, circulation or newspapers, uh, agency website, or through job search engines. But just wanted you to know that the civil service has its own job portal that will contain all the vacancies in government. So this is uh, available. So you can you can just open our uh, our website, csc.gov.ph, and then go to the job portal. And this will not only tell you what are the vacancies in the civil service commission, but all other government agencies. So they need to, to publish and they can they should submit vacancies in the commission for for us to be in uh, for them for this vacant positions to be included in the list and then um the second one if you are if you feel that you are qualified for this vacant you can now uh, you can now submit your um, job applications to the agency where there is that vacancy the qs and the um, and the document our requirements that need to be submitted is also um, um, included, in, including the qualification standards, as I've said. And you have to submit uh, to uh, all these documents uh, in the commission, in the agency where you want to apply for. And then, of course, uh, following the publication the, uh, the, is the assessment already. The next step is the assessment. Once you have applied, you will undergo the assessment. So. Uh, diff agencies will develop different methodologies uh, on, 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 on the assessment, uh, depending on the, the nature of the, the job that will be filled up. And uh, they, the requirement is for you to know they should have the human resource and manage and selection, uh, human resource merit promotion and selection board because that's supposed to be the one that will screen all applicants in their respective agencies. And they have to ensure that, they, that everything else should be uh, all the requirements based on what the agency uh, um, posted as the uh, qualification standard should be met. And then of course, uh, the appointing of, uh, the role of this selection board is to recommend to the appointing authority. So the appointing authority can be the head of the agency or the immediate supervisor. But more often than not, it's always the head of the agency. And lastly, once you make you you are chosen, you will be issued an appointment after submitting, of course, the other requirements like um, uh, clearance from the NBI. Uh, uh, physical uh, health requirements because these are all um, ensuring that when you join government you are fit to work okay and then um, I just want to, to let you know that um, this year uh, no last year we started an online um, job fair previously we've been uh, conducting starting in 20 if I'm not mistaken, in 2017, and it's a job fair that is being conducted uh, all over the country. But because of the pandemic and uh, because the requirements is to observe physical distancing, 
we partnered with uh, a private company, the Job Street, for a job fair. And uh, uh, this year, we will have another one in September because September is the month of the civil service. So again, if you are, when you talk about application, just to let you know uh, that we're one of the first agencies in, in government that really made sure that there is an equal opportunity uh, in uh, equal employment opportunity principle or the EEOP and gender equity, disability, social inclusion, meaning uh, regardless LGBTQ, we don't make any distinction. And it's very clear in our rules that nobody is discriminated by virtue of your sexual orientation and gender identity. And I'm, I'm very proud uh, the civil service is adopted because this is really one of my advocacy to, to make sure that they are not discriminated in government. So um, they, they, this can be a ground for agencies for, for us to, to, to check or to, to call their attention if we will receive um, uh, some some feedbacks that they are they are discriminated at the very uh, at the very first instance of the meeting the the requirements there and then when during the interview when when they found out that these people are you know they belong to the uh, the you know the to the LGBTQI uh, plus plus okay so that there will be no person as I said uh, that will be discriminated so now let's go to the so the status of appointment, this is already slide number 19. Okay, I think we have, sorry, uh, slide number 19. Okay, 19. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, just to, 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 uh, to let you know that this eligibility, we now also have the paper. I, uh, if I, you remember, I said that in 2020, we canceled all the exams. But this year, starting July 18, we, there are selected regions that, that, are, that will be um, conducting the examinations. And, uh, but in, uh, for some regions, a number of our regional offices uh, have already been conducting a computerized examination, which is less because we, we make sure that we follow the IATF, we submitted our proposals and they approve it. And so to, to, to make sure that these are followed. Okay, next. So let, can we now go to um, slide number 19? Okay. So I've already the publication. So yes, um, the portal. Okay, we have discussed already about this EOPT. Okay, this is now. Let me share with you what are the different types of a status of appointment. One permanent. When we say a, a permanent, it's a, it means that the persons meet all the, the qualification requirements of the position, which include education, experience, training, eligibility, and other requirements that the agency may require from you. Okay, the second temporary. This is for a person who is appointed when the person meets education, training, experience, except eligibility. Okay, except eligibility. But as long as you meet the three requirements, then you can be issued a temporary appointment. Okay, now substitute. In case a person, for example, if I, 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 got, I, I got sick for um, a number of months and the agency wanted someone to fill in that gap because I will not be reporting for six months and my position require, is really critical in carrying out the functions or the mandates of the agency. They can hire a substitute for the period where the person is not available. Okay. And um, that person should also be... Um, meeting the, the, the requirements of the job, okay. Fourth is the coterminus, okay. So the coterminus meaning there is a, the tenure is limited to a certain period specified by a law or whose continuity 
is the service is based on the trust and confidence of the appointing officer or authority or the head of the organizational unit where the person is assigned. So this is a this is a one um, 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 type of appointment that it's limited. Like for example, being the chair of the commission, my term is seven years. All my staff in the commission, from my chief of staff to my head executive assistant to my executive assistants who are lawyers and non-lawyers, and then all my administrative staff, my my secretary, and all that stuff. When my term ends, then the the they, they, their term is all uh, will also end. So that's that what that's the time when you call a uh, terminus. Okay. It depends if, if if assuming that I left and the incoming chair uh, would say, Chair Bala, yeah, is this uh, your chief of staff ba, yung head executive assistant ba, ba okay siya? Um, of course, sasabihin ko naman, okay, kasi magaling, etc. Pag sinabi niya, pwede ko ba siyang kunin? Well, um, sabi ko, it's the choice of, of my staff if they want to join you, but... They, they can they can be hired, but they can be issued another appointment. So it has been seven years, seven and seven years now. But if they so decide to to remain, they can apply for vacant positions. So that's also the advantage, yeah, no? Okay, contractual. So as, as I've said earlier, the contractual is uh, also for a temporary. Uh, I mean, you know, there's also a term period because they have to perform a certain functions that that yeah, that cannot be performed by existing um, persons occupying certain items in the in the agency. So it's a term also like uh, there's a project, special project that would be funded uh, for the next five years. Then you can they can be hired as contractual. So uh, it means they can they can also be hired for the purpose. Okay. And um, the second one is cost while uh, this number issued for essential, no? and necessary uh, services needed by the agency where it has not it has no enough regular staff and for emergency cases so uh, what are the examples of this casual positions in government like for example drivers because we it's better that you have a casual drivers than a contract of service or a job order because you know they're they're the ones uh, you know if they drive for for someone or the it's a service vehicle for the employees if, if something happens to that person, the person will never receive any benefits. So these are examples of positions that uh, a person can be appointed to. It's an emergency because the drive, uh, the, the positions are not available, so they can be appointed to, to a casual position. So those are the, and then for teachers, there is such a thing as prov provisional appointment of teachers because this is also uh, based on their law that they are as as long as they meet the other requirements except the eligibility they're given um uh, they're given uh, uh, they're, they're appointed to provisional but if there is an available eligible already who made it to and passed the uh, the, the let they, they call it the let for the, this is for their teachers then they don't have the security of tenure okay now, uh, the other one, naman, ito, this is the status of appointment, huh? permanent. Now, let's go to the, or to the uh, nature of appointment. One is, um, the, the first one is original, meaning when you are new to the government, so it, it, that regardless of the positions, that is what you call the original. The second one is promotion. So when you, when you stay in the agency for a number of years then they see that you are capable of and you are already meeting the requirements then you can be promoted the other one is a transfer so when you transfer in a month this is the appointment for an employee from one position to another of equivalent rank or a level or salary without gap in the service so it's a behind if you transfer for example from one agency or even from within from within the agency you, um, they, you will be appointed to the same position and you, it's just a transfer. You, you will not be you will not be issued an appointment, but it's just a transfer because as long as the position that you will be um, 
you it's a, it's equivalent uh, it's equivalent wrong okay and there's no um gap gap in the service okay reemployment if this is i think the, the very nature when you say reemployment it means like if you retire or you um, were employed earlier but now you want to again uh employ in government but there is a gap in service that's what we call our uh, um reemployment and then the, another one is reappointment um, reappointment is uh, when the agency is undergoing reorganization, no? So uh, they can they can be uh, appointed to the newly created positions that is equivalent to them. Okay. Um, and then the motion meaning this refers to the point to the appointment issued for a lower position, which could either be voluntary, voluntary meaning, for example, um, my position is um, is a supervisor, but I wanted to go home to my hometown because I'm I'm assigned in another place. The only vacancy that is available is is lower rung, and so therefore I can be I because that's your that's your um, choice. So then I will be demoted. And there's another one. When can one be demoted? If you there is a penalty, if you have um, uh, discipline as a result of disciplinary action or involving then as a penalty, then you can be demoted to the next uh, position. And then there another one is reinstatement. Um, for example, a person has been dismissed, but the person elevated um, the case to a higher court. For example, the commission, yeah, the commission will, will disapprove or the agency head will disapprove and then they will come to the commission for motion uh, request for, on, uh, um, for to review the case and then they will, uh, the commission will say, yes, the person is, uh, uh, is illegally de um, terminated. And so therefore you have to restore it. And then the other, and then the possibility of that is the agency will go to higher courts, like the court of appeals, if the the final decision, the, the because we have what we call uh, the appeal and then the motion for reconsideration. But if the agency so decides to elevate it to the higher courts, like the court of appeals, or even to the supreme court, and if the supreme court or the court of appeals will will affirm the decision of the commission, then you will be reinstated. Okay, so that's what we call reinstatement. And then of course, uh, reclassification, again, this is also um, when it is used when an appointment is issued due to substantial change in the regular duties and responsibilities of positions by the department of, of, um, of the, the department of budget and management. Uh, but it doesn't. It does not. It does not make any any um, um, difference as long as you will be accommodated. So it will just change the the title, but uh, it's still uh, you will be um, um, performing the same or uh, assuming the same position, the, the position equivalent to what you have earlier been uh, occupying. Now, just to um, to um, to make it um, uh, a little bit. Um, uh, easier for government in terms of the employment by virtue of the the quarantine, the pandemic in 2020 and up to now, we have issued what we call the um, this is the interim guidelines on appointments and other human resource actions for the period of state of calamity. And I think uh, I hope that the, you have been informed that the. The, the declaration of the office of the president is up to September 2021. So we have issued that um, one, uh, all the actions can now be done through virtually. They can interview you. You don't need to appear already. You, they, they are allowed already to interview you. You can submit your documents digitally. And even the issue ones of appointments, the oath taking, will now be done digitally to make it easier for the applicants and to the, to the agencies. And at the same time, to protect you from, from, you know, from acquiring, you know, when you travel from the place of, of where you live to the office. So this is also one way of deterring 
um, the pairing, um, the acquisition of the COVID-19. So, ano yung advantage? Yung ano ba yung advantage ng and the benefits? Uh, I think I have mentioned just to, um, marami nakalagay dyan, but just to make sure that I, I just highlighted what I was telling you about this in the, okay. And then, um, now, another one of the, the uh, one of the advantages of our interim guidelines, okay, the next slide. If you are, for positions involving, next slide please, essential services such as those in the field of health and medicine, agencies may fill up vacancies that were vacated due to uh, promotion, even while the promotional appointments of the previous incumbent is pending CSC's approval of validation. So it's been for those who would have, uh, of course, that would be, um, for, for you, this may not necessarily be the, the, your requirement um, uh, for the position. So now, um, just to, to wrap up, the commission is your partner. And uh, I hope that you have, you have, I have given you the, the basics of uh, what maybe one of the questions later on that you may ask is, what are the positions that I can, I can apply for if I am a newly graduate? Diba? So later on, you can ask all those questions that you have in mind, because I just wanted to, to, to uh, what I presented uh, was the overview of joining government service. But uh, I think you must have uh, observed that there are also requirements that may be waived by virtue of the positions that are the nature of positions that you will be applying for. So with that, marami marami salamat tong, uh, Ron. I cannot, I cannot uh, um, say no to your invitation because of our previous uh, partnership uh, in, 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 our, in, the, in the work in government when you were still with the Office of the, office of the President. So marami marami salamat sa inyo. That was the civil service chair um, giving us a crash course on um, government service. So thank you very much, Chair Alicia de la Rosa. Um, before we proceed to the testimonials, we would like to remind all of our participants and guests that you have to answer the link that we'll show later on in our Zoom and in our Facebook Live because it's the requirement for the issuance of your certificates of participation. This link will be only active until 7 p.m. tonight, so make sure to click it and to answer it. So now we'll proceed to the testimonials portion. We have uh, a few other uh, esteemed government servants, and um, they've dedicated their lives to serving the Philippines through government service. So we'll begin first with Undersecretary Michael Christian Ablan. Attorney Christian R. Ablan is the Undersecretary for Administration and Finance of the Philipp Presidential Communications Operations Office, or PCOO. He's also concurrently the director of the FOI Project Management Office, or FOI PMO. He's a lawyer by profession. He finished his law studies at the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and his master in public policy at the University of Auckland. Prior to joining PCOO, Yusek Chris worked at the Office of the Solicitor General, the Public Private Partnership Center, and the Commission on Elections. Currently, he also holds the rank of CESO II in the Career Executive Service. Uh, Yusek, Chris, please share with us your testimonial for our graduating audience. You have the floor. Bob. Thank you, Attorney Paul John. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much to Congressman Sal for uh, inviting me over to be a uh, to share uh, my experience in government. How can you follow uh, Chief Justice Esmundo and Chairperson Alicia De La Rosa Bala? I'm just glad I'm not following uh, Chairman De Vera, Commissioner Dumpit, and uh, Judge Tan. So uh, I'll take it as a good uh, time to share. Um, it was very nice to uh, hear uh, the very complete uh, given by uh, Chair Bala a while ago as I reminisce my journey to being a government uh, official. Uh, lahat po ng sinabi po niya ay nadaanan ko po. No? 
uh, from being a contractual to being a job order to being a permanent employee, a co-terminus employee, uh, from the lowest rank all the way up to my rank now as undersecretary. Uh, just to share with you uh, my uh, my experience uh, for those of you who are graduating from high school and enter and college as well. As uh, don't be scared no of uh, government no, and you don't have to start at government from the very beginning. Uh, it just uh, it just might land on your lap, and if it's something that you are uh, enjoying, uh, then you might as well uh, stay with it. I did not have all of my career in government. In some parts of my uh, career, I was in the private sector, and I'll share share with you why I chose to go back to to government. I actually started my career as a tour guide for the House of Representatives. Uh, I uh, worked uh, while I studied in, in law. Uh, after finishing the bar, uh, my first job was actually in a law firm. Uh, while I had always wanted to join government, uh, like what Congressman Salome mentioned by Congressman Salo earlier, uh, most of our colleagues were practicing law uh, and I wanted to see, I didn't want to have any regrets. So I wanted to share with you guys that, you know, you, you, you guys continue to experiment and do things uh, and, then, and then learn from them. Because for me, I didn't go, to, go back to government work immediately. Uh, I went to private practice. I worked for a small law firm in Makati. And there I learned that I was not cut out for corporate law practice. Uh, and I said, no, I, I will go back to government, which was my first love. So I joined the Office of the Solicitor General as a solicitor, uh, practiced for a while, and then I uh, ran for public office. I ran for local office. Uh, I was elected for provincial board member, and I served, and I had fun uh, serving as a local legislator. Uh, I also ran for higher office, very similar to Congressman Salo. Uh, for Congress, I did not win. Uh, not win uh, there is a one-year ban from working in government so I had to uh, go back to the private sector I actually work as a legal counsel for a CSO an NGO which is Philippine business for social progress uh, I worked there for more than uh, two years and then took up my master's and then when I came back uh, I actually already joined government again kasi Iba talaga yung feeling if uh, serving others is something that uh, you like uh, to do. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I, I worked in the private sector for some time. And uh, even if the salary was competitive, uh, I could do the work. Uh, I did not find meaning. And I only found meaning when I was working in government. So again, we are not forcing you to join government. You can try the private sector. And if you, you feel... Uh, you know, uh, a lack of, of, of direction, I think, and, and, and if you are happy helping other Filipinos, then uh, maybe a government work is good for you. So I joined, uh, like was, what was mentioned by Attorney Pozon, uh, the uh, Public-Private Partnership Center uh, as a policy uh, chief, and then I moved on to the Commission on Elections, uh, working for uh, one of the commissioners. And then finally, I got appointed as an assistant secretary uh, under the leadership of Secretary Martin Andanar at the PCOO. Like I mentioned, aside from being a job order, contractual, and regular, uh, nadaanan ko din yung third level, which is the career executive service. Uh, gaya ng sinabi ni uh, Chairman Bala, uh, kaming mga assistant secretaries and undersecretaries, wala kaming uh, security of tenure. So we serve at the discretion and trust and confidence of the appointing authority. But if you are a career executive service officer, you have a certain security of tenure. And so I went through the motions. So I also did my CS examinations. Hindi ako cum laude. Hindi ako honor. So I took my CS professional. And then eventually I also took up my career executive service written examination until I got my rank as a CESO uh, too. So that's it, guys. I want to end... Uh, and we, we will discuss more if you have any questions for me. Uh, I'd like to end with a statement from computer scientist Paul Graham. And Paul Graham said, instead of working back uh, from a goal, work forward from promising situations. I started out with a goal. I wanted to be like Congressman Salo and be a congressman, but uh, things did not pan out for me. And since then, I've changed my way of thinking and moved 
into promising uh, situations. And so uh, I started out as an assistant secretary appointed and now I am a career executive service officer under secretary. Thank you so much and back to you. Thank you very much for that testimonial, Yusek Michael Christian Ablan. Our next um, panelist who give her testimonial is uh, the Civil Service Chair, Alicia De La Rosa Bala. Ma'am, ma you have the floor, Paul. 